In 1971, phenomena of supposedly paranormal origin occurred in the Spanish village Belmes de Moralera. These colorations appeared on the concrete floor of a house kitchen, which were interpreted as images of faces of paranormal origin. The events allegedly were strongly connected to the physical presence of the then 52 years old Maria Gomez Camara. This is a, a picture of the Andalusian village in Spain. The so-called Belmas faces attracted considerable attention in the public and the media, as well as in the European parapsychological community. The case was exciting because the phenomena seemed to have the character of permanent paranormal objects, PPOs. Unlike normal volatile RSPK phenomena, PPOs are preserved and can be well studied. And now we have here a picture of uh, the second phase that occurred on the floor. The first was destroyed because it was a little bit ear too eerie uh, for this uh, Maria, this we can call her focus person. Here we have a scheme of the room where it occurs here. And this is the house. And you can see on this middle picture that later they uh, mounted this picture at the wall behind a glass pane. One characteristic of the faces was the dynamics of the formations. They manifested themselves at different speeds on some occasions directly under the eyes of witnesses and sometimes disappeared again or changed their appearance. I reported at the PA 2017 in Athens on the attempts of parapsychologists Hans Bender and Germán de Agumosa in 1972 and 73 to provide proof of the paranormal nature of the phenomena with fraud proof experiments. Another topic was the precarious relationship of the an alleged, allegedly RSPK case, public sphere, skeptics, fake news and the problematic influence of mass media. A detailed description of this uh, part can be found in the corresponding chapter of the book N equals one. Outside of Spain, the spectacular case was rather forgotten, probably partly because of misrepresentations, but the interests of the Spaniards themselves remained lively. And here you can see a uh, graffiti uh, uh, from Madrid in the 2010 years or so. And you can see that uh, this face became iconic in Spain. A conventional attempt at explanation of the faces was pareidolia. This means that what were seen as faces or actually amorphous patches created by change in moisture conditions. But the pareidolia hypothesis was not considered very convincing. You can get an idea by looking at the photographs. And you can see here this part of the uh, concrete floor with different small faces that occurred at the floor. And here you have another, uh, uh, pictures of these faces. Here's one large, here's a small one, here are eyes, here's one, you can see here one. This is uh, La Pelona, it will play a, a role after uh, a little later. So um, this, one can uh, say that each of these uh, faces could be explained by pareidolia, but not in some, not altogether. From the beginning, there was a suspicion that the faces might have been created by fraud. Someone could have painted the faces on the concrete floor unobserved. Bender's and Argumosa's attempts to exclude this possibility was to cover the floor with plastic sheets and seal it. If faces appear under the sealed surface, this should serve as proof that they were not created by fraud. So here we can see Hans Bender 
and the Spanish uh, worker and here students uh, with a cover of this um, concrete floor from that uh, covering experiment. The researchers failed to obtain 100% proof of the genuineness of alleged psi phenomena due to unfortunate circumstances and methodological inaccuracies on the part of some of the persons involved. Since I was initially interested primarily in the historical reconstruction of Bender's investigation and the role of mass media, I was content uh, with the findings and the not 100% proof. But there is a second possibility to examine the genuineness of the images. They can be analyzed thoroughly at the material level. If fabricated by a skilled painter or restorer, corresponding paint pigments and possibly brush marks should be detectable on the concrete floor. My friend Peter Mulac asked me for more details from such attempts after hearing my lecture in Athens. Therefore, I went back into the subject and together with my Spanish colleague Pilar, tried to reconstruct the material analysis that were done on the faces. In addition to the facts mentioned in published text, the following overview is based on partially unpublished investigation reports and other archival materials. It required a special explanation that the faces partly emerged only gradually and also changed their shape again. One of these explanations seemed to be the use of silver salt solution in which the blackening of the silver pigments occurs only gradually under the influence of light. Already in February 1972, this explanation based on a laboratory experiment was published in the press and presented as the solution of the mystery. This was done under pressure of the government as it turned out later. Here you have uh, this, uh, this um, article of a newspaper where it uh, uh, said, Se acabó el misterio, the mystery is over. Other su suggestions to create the faces without using externally applied color pigments and org organic binders involve the use of cement solvent or hydrochloric acid. Thus, we have two forms of conventional explanatory hypothesis in addition to pareidolia. First, light sensitive silver salts or other chemicals were applied resulting in corresponding discolorations of the concrete floor or second, the faces were produced by applying paint. Both hypotheses can be tested with material analysis looking for silver salts, color pigments, organic binders, and processing traces. According to Maria, the assumed focus person, material samples were already taken during the first investigation by, how she called it, by the scientific police from Madrid. They had apparently found no traces of paint or fraud in general, but no final report exists on this initial investigation. In the following years, far further material analysis were carried out in order to clarify the question whether the faces were produced by human hands or were occurred in a paranormal way. The first documented material analysis was carried out by J.J. Alonso and his team in 1975. Alonso was director of the Hydrological and Natural Environment Institute of the University of Valencia. They extracted a cement slab from the ground on which the face, la pelona, that means the bald, is found, and brought it to the laboratory for various examinations. Oh, sorry. Um, so here we can see um, the bald, 
picture of this uh, of this face and how they uh, they bring it out into the laboratory. A total of six samples were analyzed. A cement sample from the image of an eye of an unidentified wellness face and two soil samples taken of a depth of 1.5 meters and three meters below the slab with the faces and furthermore, three splinters taken from three areas of the cement block with the face La Pelona. The most important results in short, silver was not found. The composition of the cement contained the usual constituents even if the proportion varied significantly in the two samples. A melon melanocratic uh, components, that means star components, were present in both the cement and the soil sample from 1.5 meters depth, but not in the soil sample from three meters depth. The investigators considered both substances to be identical due to their similarity and possibly responsible for the production of the images. Unfortunately, the report does not indicate if their chemical identity was actually tested. Alonso saw also a similarity of the outline of La Pelona. I go back to this picture, you can see it here, um, of La Pelona with a shoe. In his opinion, the phase occurred because a person set foot on the concrete floor while the cement was still soft. The pressure transmitted by the shoe had favored the rise and penetration of the melanocratic substance which then led to corresponding accumulations at the edges. However, this does not explain the appearance of the other faces. Two further analyses were conducted by the Grupo Hepta in 1991 and 1994. Grupo Hepta is a private non-commercial research group for the investigation of paranormal phenomena founded in 1987. The group commissioned two materials scientists to analyze two small samples with regard to their granulometric, mineralogical and chemical properties. Analysis showed that the two samples, which look the same, differed considerably in composition in terms of percentages. You can see it here in this table, uh, the quantities of the uh, elements. Lead, chromium and zinc are used in the production of paints. However, the quantities found are so small that they are not to be considered as components of applied paints for the product production of the faces. It turned out that the samples taken were too small for the planned comprehensive analysis. Therefore, a further analysis was commissioned in 1994 with samples from two phases. Sample one came from the phase cara grande con dientes, that means large face with teeth. Sample two from cara el lado del escalón de la entrada, face next to the entrance step. We were unable to identify which faces were meant as there was no consistent naming for most of them. But one was perhaps this one because it was very large and at one um, point in time, there were uh, teeth visible. Despite improved analysis, uh, capabilities, the core results relevant to the question of authenticity did not reveal anything new. Silver salts or typical components of artists' paints were again not found. In 2014, a fourth analysis was carried out on behalf of the television program Cuarto Milenio. The program covers topics related to parapsychology, animalistics, conspiracy theories, and mystery. It is hosted by two journalists 
Iker Jimenez and Carmen Potter. The TV program was broadcast on September 7, 2014 under the title Operation Belmes, the Definitive Answer. The material analysis was again performed on La Pelona, this, the bald. It was conducted under the direction of Dr. Jose Gracinea, an expert on painting techniques. In front of the eyes of a notary, material samples were taken in several places from La Pelona, put into an envelope, which was sealed by the notary. The investigations were carried out by means of infrared spectroscopy, which can detect organic components of paints, resins, and scanning electron microscopy to detect inorganic components of the paint, the pigments. The central results of the chemical investigation confirmed those of the older analysis, namely, neither silver salts nor organic residues of paint were detectable. The samples consist of substances that occur naturally in cement. The stains that form the face are due to the heterogeneity of the cement. The face was not made by applying paint and no evidence of external manipulation was found. In a second step, an experiment was carried out by Dr. Luis Alamancos, an expert on forensic criminology and Antonio Busto, a chemist. This second approach attempted to produce the faces in a conventional way by coating cement plates with different substances. First, a cement solvent, second, hydrochloric acid, and third, silver nitrates with the addition of UV light, all proposals of skeptics to explain the origin of the faces. The results of these productions were analyzed and compared with the original image, La Pelona, using a microscope and a special light source to analyze the deeper layers of the cement. The results of this experiment invalidate the conventional hypothesis about the origin of the analyzed faces. The white strokes or areas produced with cement solvent on the cement slabs close the pores of the cement. This does not correspond in any way to the surface texture of the faces. The application of 24% hydrochloric acid produces marks on the cement that reasonably resemble the faces, but fade and even disappear after 32 hours, contradicting the permanence of many faces. The traces drawn with silver salts are immediately no longer visible at the moment of application, so that the supposed author would have painted the sometimes complex faces without seeing what he was painting. Blackening by UV light is delayed and the faces would have been formed after about 36 hours. In no case would the longer term developments in many faces be explained. And here you can see uh, the de development of uh, this first La Pava over several months. And um, this is very remarkable, I would say. Um, the possibility that the images could have been formed in such a way as suggested by the three conventional explanatory hypotheses is thus rejected. Moreover, the surface analysis of the original phase did not reveal any traces of brushes, instruments, or substances that would have altered the pores of the cement, as has been shown with all forms of external manipulation. Taken together, the four material analyses give a fairly consistent picture, despite the sometimes somewhat meager details of the accessible reports. Come to the conclusion, the conventional explanations for the formation of the picture suggested by skeptics are not supported by the analysis. Of course, the fact that the analysis of 2014, as well as those of Grupo Hepta in, in the 1990s, were commissioned by supporters of the paranormal hypothesis must be viewed critically. However, 
the material analysis inside in the decisive findings with those of Alonso's early analysis. His report shows that, the remained, that he remained skeptical about the paranormal hypothesis as he offered a conventional, albeit implausible, explanation for the origin of the face he examined, this shoe print. The same critical attitude can be assumed for the first material analysis commissioned by the police, for which no report was published. The goal of the police at that time was clearly to prove fraud and end the nonsense, which obviously did not succeed. Together with all the interview data containing statements from persons directly and indirectly involved, as well as the results from the covering experiments, a plausible conventional explanation for the emergence of these phases during the first phase of appearance in the early 1970s is still missing. It is as if the dark, the melachronetic particles in the cement had arranged themselves in a hitherto inexplicable way to facial forms. Since relatively large amounts of moisture were detected, especially in connection with the early sealing and covering experiments of Bender and Agumasa, this could play a significant role in formation of the faces in connection with the hygroscopic properties of the soil material. However, the anomalistic or psychokinetic aspect remains unaffected by such speculation. The same applies to the fact that the material analyses were performed on only a few faces. It is difficult to deny an anomalistic component to the Balmas faces as an overall phenomenon, phenomenon, even if some of the faces would have been faked. Why should it be worthwhile to reconstruct the case in detail after almost 50 years? In addition to the exemplary issues of methodological, social and media policy handling of the occurrences reported in my Athens lecture, this reanalysis revealed that this is an extremely remarkable case of paranormal activity in many respects that has been able to withstand discrediting from skeptics. Even if the final proof was lacking in the covering experiments and the individual material analysis did not reach today's standards of documentation quality taken together and taking into account the available rich archive material, a clear picture emerges. The Belmas faces represent one of the most remarkable, very well-documented anomalies of the 20th century. They deserve an appropriate place in the history of parapsychological spontaneous case research, which is not particularly rich in such well-documented anomalies. The mystery remains. And I'm finished. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Gerhardt. You think you're finished, but no, not quite yet. <laughs> um, if anyone has questions, you're welcome to put them into the chat. Um, so uh, one of the questions that I had about this, Gerhardt, is um, was there any discussion of analyzing the drawing style of the faces and whether there might be some some similarity between what was created? Yeah, that, that took place. And even that was one, one uh, argument for example, by Joe Nickel, the skeptic who only saw the one picture of the this uh, very uh, first phase I shown, and he said, "Yeah, it's clear that must have been a very unskilled painter who did it." But so uh, there were obviously some yeah uh, attempts to to um, make correlation to uh, certain um, painting styles. For example, the first one with the Byzantine style or so, but it didn't, um, um, yeah, brought a lot of insight, I would say. Yes, and I guess because they did it, they did determine if it could have been the result of brush strokes or some sort of drawing, that becomes less likely that it was actually drawn. Is that correct? I missed the first part of your question because the sound was uh, not on, uh, was bad. 
So, so I, I, I guess because there was an analysis done of, and there was no signs of brush strokes or any sort of drawing, mm -hmm. that that kind of dismisses the idea that it was uh, some- Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. At least for the one that for the, these phases that are analyzed, I mean, many of the phases are not analyzed, but the ones that are analyzed, there is no no um, traces of of, of painting um, detected. So mm -hmm. that seems to me very clear. Yeah. Great. So since this was a private home, were the researchers in control of the environment throughout the investigation? I mean, uh, that time, at the first time they tried this experiment with the covering so that, uh, and, and they sealed uh, the covers so that they try to control it, but then this moisture came out of the soil and they had to, to remove the, the coverings. And so this, you know, this, this uh, fraud proof experiment failed because there was no notary to, to uh, control the removement. And, and so in, in, in a later in a later experiment, they sealed the whole room and built a new kitchen at the site to have better control. But this time, um, the photographs that were taken before the sealing of the room and after were too bad in quality, so that uh, and the results were not uh, impressive enough than it was uh, the time before. So again, the hundred percent proof failed. Also this time. So they did a lot of a lot of attempts to make good controls, but uh, a trickster again, perhaps. <laughs> so were were there intuitives involved in this, and were there, if there were, were their feelings and and impressions recorded at the beginning, and uh, how does that relate to kind of the atmosphere that was in the house? Yeah, I mean, even from the very beginning, there. There are a lot of um, there are mediums there. There were astrologers there, and everybody detected a lot of interesting stuff. Uh, partly uh, um, contrary um, statements, but uh, and I have to say, uh, Germán de Argumosa, this uh, Spanish um, parapsychologist, he was very in interested in the electric voice phenomenon that was at that time a very hot topic, so to say, in parapsychology. And he started to make uh, recordings and he also get some uh, EVPs, but this all led to the, to the interpretation, to a spiritist interpretation of this phenomenon. And Bender was not interested in this at all. So, and the, but the, the, the newspapers jumped on it, the yellow press and, uh, now the, the faces are speaking, they combine the electric voice phenomenon. And this again brought the skeptics and this, not the normal skeptics, so to say, but there was a, a um, Padre Quevedo, it was a Spanish um, priest and he was a fighter against spiritism. And so he attacked Bender and Agumosa a lot because uh, he thought they would, uh, propose a spiritualist uh, interpretation of the faces, what Bender and Nakamosa did not do. So there was a lot of controversy all around these first investigations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, very interesting question. Were there, do you know of any history of any artists who may have passed away in this area who might be trying to co communicate or any other sort of paranormal phenomena besides this in that same location? in the same location or well, in the same area uh i don't know of of this i mean maybe as a as a further detail around this house there is a i mean it's a classical uh uh haunted haunting narrative now the house is built on a on a on a graveyard it's close to the church and when they when the first phase appeared you know, when the second appeared and they, they uh, put it away and they dig uh, uh, into the ground and they found actually a, a human skeleton without a, a skull. And so that was clear, okay, uh, this is an unquiet dead. And so we have to bury this, these bones and then everything will be okay. But that was not the case for the faces occurred and the faces occurred even over the years, you know, and even nowadays, um, 
in another house, in the birth house of uh, this Maria. Maria passed away in 2004, but these faces are still uh, a topic. And uh, it's even that there are two riv rivaling or rivalry uh, family uh, lines. And the one they, uh, they uh, um, have the birth house of Maria and the other the house, uh, this original house where she lived. And so there is a lot of controversy, but um, they even try to repeat the, the first um, experiments with clothing the room. They, they closed it for six months and tried if, if there are new faces on the wall in the birth house. And actually there were some stains that could be interpreted as, as uh, faces. But I think these later occurrences cannot be um, compared with the early ones. So what I talked about was only these early uh, occurrences or appearances, yeah. So you spoke about a brief bit about how the media really got involved with this and promoted this and made it such a big issue. Do you think this may have influenced the number of faces that began to appear or the or anything related to the case? I don't think that that has a direct influence on the on the amount of faces that appears. It seems that uh, that actually uh, was in a way correlated with uh, with um, uh, how should I say how Maria felt when she was ill, and then there are more or less, or so there are periods when uh, less uh, faces appear and more, but it was mainly during the first. Um, face during the first one or two years that uh, this this occurred. And then, I mean, Hans Bender thought at the uh, annual, annual day, you know, after one year, maybe at that very day, new faces appear. So he tried to create a second experiment at the day, but that was not the case uh, this way. So yeah, there's still a lot of mystery, but we have, extremely many documents in our archive reports about all this uh, all these struggles also with the media because there was then a fake um, fake news so one journalist uh, invented a statement by the a photographer of the village that he confessed that he created this face and this was a pure invention and you even can find this this statement as an explanation on Wikipedia or in these books, in newer books, you know, this kind of fake news are very persistent. So, and so far, I think it's it's worth that uh, I went a little deeper into this case uh, together with Pilar, and that we, yeah, put uh, some or corrected some of these fake news that were created at the time. So. Um... You know, I'm relating questions that have been presented here. So um, after five decades of trying to demonstrate that it's not fraud, is there really any evidence that it's a paranormal phenomena? Or do you think there will be evidence found that it's a paranormal phenomena? I think based on the documents we have, we can assume with a, a highly high security that at least some of the faces occurred in a paranormal way. So there is no conventional explanation so far, in my opinion, considering all the data we have together, even if the experiment of Bender was not 100% proof, he was convinced that it is a genuine paranormal phenomenon. But uh, he also accepted that it was not 100% proof what he has, but he didn't have this, uh, material analysis. And I think that, you know, the first investigation by the police, you have to, to consider that that was uh, still a, a dictatorian regime with Franco as a dictator in Spain, and everybody was uh, cautious, you know, and um, my Spanish colleagues, colleagues said uh, nobody would have made fraud and created such a steer in the public. The people are traveling there uh, um, because it was too dangerous. And then the, you know, this first investigation group from the police came and they stayed 
about one week in this house and tried everything to figure out and they didn't find anything. So this is a strong, also a strong argument. So knowing all the details, also the sociological details, everything speaks uh, for a genuine paranormal phenomenon. Well, you know, it's been such a interest. It's such an interesting phenomenon, and it did capture the attention of the public. And you know, it's wonderful that you're able to take the time to dig into it and learn more about the details. If people want more information about this, do you have a place that you could refer them to learn more? Yeah, I mean, in in the chapter of my book, there is a, uh, an overview, but not so much on the material analysis. Um, I only mentioned it shortly. I have a paper in German. But uh, yeah, you have these Google translators or so. <laughs> so that is available on the, on, on the website of, uh, on my website or on Academia Edu or so. I also could provide it then, yeah. Sure, you might, you might uh, put it in the chat. And I'm, thank you so much. It was, it was a, just a really wonderful and interesting presentation. There's so much, so much behind this that then uh, it brings so many different things together. And the historical investigation really, uh, it was very diligent. Thank you, Gerhard.